Hello, everyone, and welcome to this KubeCon Cloud Native Con Europe 2 2022 summary. My name is Simon Ekman, and I'll be today's moderator. Uh, and let me now introduce the panelists of today's discussion. Let's see maybe if we can get that uh, slide up on the screen. All right, awesome, thank you. Uh, so joining me today is Jessica Andersson. From, uh, she's a product area lead engineer uh, enablement for Antonell. Uh, joining me also is Anders Eknert, developer advocate at Styra. And then we also have Casper Niesen, lead platform architect at Lunar. And Johan Torsson, CEO and co-founder at Elasticis. Welcome, everybody. Hi. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Awesome. Thank you for being here. All right. Let's start with some numbers from this year's uh, KubeCon. So if we can go to the next slide. I think you need to. Oh, maybe I can do that myself. Yeah. yeah. There we go. <laughs> All right. So this year, it was more than 7,000 attendees on site in Valencia. So that was awesome. And also more than 10,000 people joining online. And for two thirds of these people on site in Valencia, it was their first KubeCon ever. So this is actually great to see so many new faces joining, uh, joining the community. Uh, also, since uh, last KubeCon in October, uh, that was in LA, over 100 companies has joined the CNCF. So that's also an amazing increase in the amounts of uh, kind of interest in this community. And there's also a huge project momentum where we see uh, a lot of 34 projects applying to for graduation or upgrade or just being included and in in this community. So that's really uh, great to see how the community is growing. But yeah, so uh, today's uh, discussion will be obviously a summary of the KubeCon and also we will focus on the future of cloud native. So first off, I would just like to give the word to Jessica and, and uh, uh, ask you to share some of your experience from this KubeCon. And I think we can take take away the slides as well. Yes, yeah, so I think that uh, it was a great week. It was, uh, first of all, so fun to meet all of you there and like just be in on location again. It was, uh, it gives so much energy to just meet everyone and see everything. And I think it was fun to see like the trends as they have changed a little bit. It was like, mm -hmm. I think the biggest trend that I take away was the, the most focus towards developer experience and what is the next step from here? Like, how do we take all these amazing projects and build like a good workflow based on it? And and something that mm -hmm. is very, because my heart is the platform engineering, just building a platform for developer experience and making it easy to consume these applications. And I think there was a lot of great conversations on that topic last week. Right. Would you say that's more now than it's been before that we're now developing a platform for developers rather than just developing a platform? Has that focus yeah. kind of shifted? Yeah, I would say so. I think that uh, in the past, uh, past few times I've been to and the conversation in general in the industry has been so much more focused on like on developing and building the tools and what they can do and not so much on the user experience on, on being the end user, the consumer of these type of uh, projects and, and, and products that, uh, that are uh, that we are looking at. And I think that uh, just the last spring, the last few months, there has been so many more conversations. There is also like a new uh, free to attend conference that is happening in two weeks that is called PlatformCon, which is like dedicated to this subject in general. Uh, and uh, so I would say that definitely the conversation has started. I've been in there working with platform engineering for the last, I think, six or seven years. And I would say that compared to when I started out today, there's a lot more conversations going around about this and a lot of more sharing between different companies, sharing user stories. How do you approach this? What, what things are you doing in order to achieve good developer experience? Yeah, uh, that's, that's great input. Thank you, Jessica. What do you think about this trend, Casper, as you're also working as a kind of a platform architect and what's your experience here? Yeah, I, I totally agree with Jessica on, on this, that developer productivity engineering or platform engineering or plat de de developer enablement or whatever we, we call it uh, is, is definitely on, on the rise. Um, we should probably align on the word, uh, on, on what we actually, <laughs> the term and define, defining that. Mm -hmm. uh, but if I have to choose something else than that, I would say multi-cluster, multi-cloud uh, is definitely also a thing that's picking up um, 
and probably becoming inevitable for, for many companies that they need to be present in in multiple places and 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 how do you actually do that i think that is definitely uh yeah one of the the things that were on on my radar last week as as, as well and and how are peach people or the community trying to approach this problem with managing multiple setups on multi multiple clouds and so on yeah, definitely the word service mesh comes to mind, right? Uh, but also uh, <laughs> the, that, that was a lot of talk about um, EBPF, uh, how EBPF okay. possible uh, could be a solution to to use um, uh, the Cilium uh, with proxyless or pro service, so what is it called, sidecarless uh, service mesh. Um, so that, that was definitely a hot topic last week. Um, but, but you know, service mesh in general and how to connect uh, clouds is, uh, yeah, was definitely a, a hot topic. Okay, thank you. And Anders, what's your uh, takeaways when it comes to this multi-cloud? Um, what's your input on this topic that Casper mentioned? Uh, yeah, good question. I, I don't think I, I really got that much from like the multi-cloud perspective mm -hmm. as a security vendor. I kind of tended to, to focus on, on that. Uh, where there's definitely this big trend of, of supply chain security. A lot of vendors, a lot of talks, a lot of focus on on the supply chain, like everything from like uh, image signing verification and how do you how do you know uh, what kind of dependencies to trust? How do you track your dependencies mm -hmm. across like applications and your infrastructure and this kind of all these dependencies and then uh, we just started to kind of scratch the surface on that. So I think that that's definitely an emerging trend. And I think it's it's not going to be solved for the next KubeCon. So I think we'll see a lot of uh, we'll see a lot more of that in the future too. What's your take on that? You on kind of this evolving security landscape? Yeah, and I mean that all the previous presenters took my topic, so let me try to elaborate. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> no, but there that's fine. We can dig dig some... deeper into these topics yeah. if that's the key trends we're seeing. No, but I mean overall, this focus on sort of increased productivity for developers and security, including supply chain, suggests a lot that this is technology is maturing and people are adopting this almost to the extent that some of the some of the things becoming boring, and that's that's really a good sign. What, what I what I think we will see in the future is that I mean, as we saw in in the introductory numbers, there's so many products and so many great ways of doing it. So it's, and also the CNCF has made a statement: there are no kingmakers, and they're going to be very unopinionated about what is the best solution in some spaces. But I think this there will be too much freedom of choice in the future, so people will really try to look for more standardized patterns, sort of like a LAMP stack. So how do you actually run a Kubernetes developer platform? And not just everyone cherry picking their own tools, but some some standardized packaging or patterns will emerge. And there was a lot of discussions about the need for that in the, in one panel where the, the sort of oversight committee coordinating everything tech had a, some good discussions with people re representing end users and freedom from choice versus freedom of choice. And I think we'll see sort of a step back here, which is a good thing because that simplifies. Okay. And and for all these new projects that are popping up, are we seeing that they're more kind of niched in a secure, uh, say for security or more niched for compliance or do we see, or is it new projects in all over everything cloud native or what's your take on that, say, Jessica? Yeah, I would say that it, it is, the new projects are everywhere. It's like some of them are niched towards the security aspect, some of them are not. And I also would say that when it comes to the maturity of the project, they take it into different consideration. Let's say you have one project that is not really niched towards security and it's in the sandbox stage, then they will probably not have that much security. Not, of course, not nothing, but not that much. And then it's as a part of being more and more major projects going into uh, incubating or to graduate that you have the requirement to actually take these things into consideration and have a good plan on it in order to reach the graduate state, for instance. So depending on where the project is in its maturity, it would take different amount of consideration of that, I would say. 
Yeah, maybe just a, a small comment yeah, as well. Sure. I think uh, that was a really great talk by uh, Dave Salotaski from, uh, which is on the end user or the TOC as an end user representative um, of CNCF, who's also behind, uh, or at least uh, working at Spotify, who was behind Backstage. And uh, I really liked his announcement that uh, that they really see Backstage as this new front end for a lot of these CNCF projects and, and to help the community adopt these mm -hmm. tools by also providing a way to create, you know, UIs uh, that work better than and supporting developers that normally are probably not that used to CLIs. Uh, it's definitely some out there that prefer a UI instead of a CLI. So I think mm -hmm. that is also a, something that could help this trend um, if we if all projects that are sort of contributing to the CNTF actually build a front end and, and build a plugin for Backstage and, and make that the preferred portal for, for accessing tooling. And what is it that we see kind of going back to this, that there's a lot of focus on developer experience and so on? Uh, you want from your experience, how how is the community kind of addressing this question and what is it that the developers actually want from the platform? <laughs> That's a great question for me, not being a developer anymore. <laughs> but I mean, the I think the sort of finding the right type of mental abstractions that makes it predictable and kind of boring to do this thing. So recreating that super smooth, either local development experience, running a stuff on your laptop or getting something more Heroku style, very integrated, very lean with sort of convenient paths for doing the, the ordinary task and not requiring a lot of mental bandwidth in connecting and configuring things. I guess that's that's the heart of it. Mm. Okay. And what you want there's from a security perspective when it comes to kind of application developers and their experience, what what do you see that they kind of want from the security tools? Is it that they shouldn't have to worry about security because it's already automated away via tools or is it that they want to work a lot with security and help tools that kind of enable them to work with this or? Yeah, no, I, I think there's definitely this trend of, of shifting responsibilities left, mm -hmm. which kind of means that you kind of move uh, all these compliance check, all these security, uh, whatever it might be, policy checks. Uh, and of course, like definitely applies to the, the supply chain as well. So if you're doing those checks in like the build and deployment pipeline, that's way too late because uh, then there's there's not you kind of lose this quick feedback cycle or feedback loop that is kind of imperative for a good developer experience. So I think that's definitely one of the the trends which kind of it kind of hooks into both like the developer experience and it definitely hooks in, into uh, any of the projects uh, that we are working on like who are in the security space. So if you're kind of trying to do security in the build and deployment pipeline or in the gateway or wherever it might be, like you're, you're, you're doing it wrong. But it's, I think like kind of shift left is, is still like, it's, it's really not about shifting left as in moving left. It's about like you pretty much copy something to the left because you still want it in the build and depo deployment pipeline. It's obviously mm -hmm. useless to, to have it some uh, compliance checks only run in in at developer workstation. So, so, so yeah, that, that's definitely one of the key trends in the security space. How do we how do we do these checks? And and sometimes like these checks could be very extensive. So if you want to run like if you want to run compliance tests and ask like a ten minute scan of something, that's that's obviously not going to fly if you if you want to do that on each commit and if you want to be quick in your iteration. So. A lot of like, kind of back and forth compromises and and mm -hmm. trying to figure out like how do we balance like good security uh, and a good developer experience. Can oh, I just add on to that? Yeah, please. Because the shift left was like it was at least several times a day. Some was like let's yeah we need to shift left we need to shift left left and as I read it it's like we need to make this more available for, to the developers and, and make them give them access to, and control of these uh, things. And when we're talking about that, we also need to, that's when the developer experience becomes important because we're shifting operations to the developers, we're shifting security to the uh, developers, we're shifting, uh, we're shifting all the things to the developers. And I, I don't know about your developers, but my developers don't really 
have the bandwidth to focus on all these different things that they should care about. And so the developer experience becomes so much more important. And, and I think that is what I, I, I want to iterate over that again. I, I think that's, that is what needs required to take all these things to the next level. We need to make the developer experience sustainable because uh, the cognitive load of keeping all these things in mind. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm struggling with it and I'm focusing only on these things. So how about someone else that is trying to write, build a product as well? That, mm -hmm. that we need to find a good way to, to make this so, so streamlined, such a golden path that the developer mm -hmm. don't have to care about it and they can just follow along the paved road and, and get it for free more or less. And then have all these things and have control over it and the transparency of it without having to decide what to do. <laughs> I think yeah, exactly. Both. Yeah. Oh, uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, I was just wanted to, to to say that before devs were f was you know throwing stuff to the operations, and now operations are throwing things the other way. Mm -hmm. And we really need to support our developers in actually you yeah. know catching that responsibility, as you say, mm -hmm. um, and abstract a lot of those things away. Just make it easy and um, and build in all the same defaults. That's also what we are doing at Lunar. Is basically hide away all, all the hard stuff and and make. Whatever we provide our developers actionable or provide them with the right, you know, descriptions of their CVE, what is important, what is not important, so that they can actually do their job and then make that take on that responsibility and, and make it as, mm -hmm. as easy for them as possible. Mm -hmm. Do you have something to add here, Johan, to this discussion? No, I just wanted to say that it was beautifully summarized that we're shifting left, we're not dumping left. So the developers yes. needed support from security expert or and the other type of operator in actually doing this. And also to, to all the listeners out here, if you have any questions uh, on the topics that we're talking about here uh, during the summary, feel free to paste them in the chat and we'll see if we have uh, time to answer them here uh, during this live session. So feel, feel free to ask questions. All right, so we covered this user experience and security and so on. Is there any other key trends here that you saw at KubeCon? Kind of leaving it open here if someone has something else to add. I can I can go ahead. Uh, yeah. I had one big aha moment uh, when I attended a talk around uh, crossplane and digital twins and how DFDS uh, were using crossplane to sort of represent uh, real world items such as ships and trucks and terminals. And using Kubernetes and Crossplane to actually manage um, those APIs and remote uh, things. That was uh, really interesting to see how you could use. So this was, I think, more or less a POC, but just uh, using Crossplane and custom providers in Crossplane to to do and and map all kinds of APIs and use the uh, the, the interesting concept, but which is in in Crossplane is the composition that you can compose your and and sort of. Again, back to the to the developer productivity and, and make it easy for developers to compose and you know build abstractions that we then um, make available to our developers. So, just an, a, an example could be a service, a simple service that runs in Kubernetes but has a dependency to a database in AWS or all kinds of other things which has an API API behind it. Mm -hmm. We can create resources that we can then compose that a service is composed of. This Kubernetes resource, this AWS resource, this user in this database, or whatever it might be. So, building custom uh, cross-plane providers was definitely like an aha moment for me because I, up until now, I've only seen it as like a Terraform mapper. Don't use Terraform, but use this instead because then we get like reconciliation and all the cool things. But we can use it for so much more. Okay, thank you, Casper. Do you, Anders, from a security perspective, see any? Kind of limitations or worries with this cross-plane setups? Uh, oh wow, I'm, I'm not really. <laughs> not, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not done a whole lot of research on on the cross-plane topic, but it, it seems like some interesting ideas. That's for sure. Do you have something you want to add here, Jessica, or you want? No, I think I, I, so. The session that Casper was talking about, I went to the other session at that point in time, but I heard so much good about it. So I'm definitely going to watch it when it comes up on YouTube. Okay, awesome, yeah. great. Uh, but I know you guys have also listed some of your must-see talks from KubeCon. So I think if we uh, want to share that slide and we can go through them one by one and kind of discuss why this is a must-see talk for the people now listening to this summary. So I don't know who had the uh, number one here listed. 
I think we all did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I think this is, uh, we, we were, uh, both me, Casper, and Johan went to this talk, uh, and uh, mm -hmm. we, uh, uh, so what it is, is a talk from Lucas uh, Shellstrom, who is one of the contributors to Kubernetes. And what he did was that he went through uh, Kubernetes, like uh, the complexity, uh, why it is, some of the complexity in Kubernetes is intentional, and some of it is accidental. But what he did was that he kind of put it into, uh, with real world analogies, he kind of explained why it is as it is, and how how it is working, uh, and, and kind of like explaining more about why it ended up the way it is. And I think it was like a really good way of context to understand why it looks like it does. And, and, and it, it's, uh, it can be helpful if you're new to Kubernetes and you don't really understand the complexity and, and why, why it's working as it does. Anything to add there? Is that more <laughs> of a beginner, like a beginner level talk? You don't need a lot of in-depth Kubernetes experience to understand it or? I would say that you would need some, but not yeah. like be an expert. You don't have to be a contributor or anything, but you probably need to mm. know a little bit what is happening. Otherwise, it mm. might be hard to connect the analogies to the technical situation. Yeah, and it, and it included uh, one analogy around uh, if you put your servers in a dishwasher and the dishwasher being Kubernetes, you get out clean servers. So yeah, definitely <laughs> check it out. <laughs> it's a, a really cool talk. <laughs> I think that one really described uh, sort of how to reason about Kubernetes as a user or as a developer is trying to extend it. So there's so much thing going on under the hood with all of these reconsolidating controllers. And if you're either going to use or extend Kubernetes, you need to work with these, not against them. I think you made a, a great point in really understanding how it works. Thank you. Uh, so for the second talk here, who wants to describe why this is a must-see talk? Yeah, uh, I can do that. I was, sure. uh, I think that was on the topic of like uh, supply chain security. Mm -hmm. It was uh, an interesting perspective on on the topic, uh, given how like so so much focus is usually on tooling, uh, kind of knowing what dependencies you pull in, and uh, yeah, whether they uh, have like. Uh, whether there are like CVs associated to those and, and so on. Uh, so what we got here in this talk is kind of the, the human angle and the human risk of, of single maintainer dependencies. And this uh, was a talk by John McBride, who is the maintainer of the, the Cobra package, which, which is a, a very popular uh, library for uh, Golang, which is basically used by yeah, I think most of these cloud native tools. So it's it's a it's a tool or it's a library to help with like doing uh, C like command or command line arguments. So it's a very popular package used by all all these tools like Kubernetes, Opa, whatnot, and it's basically maintained by John alone. So he he talked a lot about like the risks of <laughs> of of having that kind of set up for his own project and. Uh, mm -hmm. All, all the things that could go wrong, uh, and and yeah, basically ask for help to maintain that because it, it's such an important piece of software. And I think like there are definitely hundreds of of these kind of dependencies in in many of these larger projects. Okay, thank you. That actually sounds really interesting. Okay, uh, so number three. Who wants to explain why this is a must be talk? Uh, I can take that one because uh, I feel very strongly about this. This is basically what I was talking about before. Uh, so the talk is by Daniel Bryan from Ambassador Labs, and it's called like from Kubernetes to product as a platform as a service to what's next, like what is coming next. And what he does is that he talks about the things that we talked about now, like how how to take this to the golden path and and making it more available and, and like working on the developer experience to make it approachable and, and consumable without too much cognitive load. And uh, I, this is like, Daniel is one of the presenters that I use. I just lean back and watch because he's he, he's such a good presenter and you can just uh, ride along and, and uh, it's easy to take in what he's sharing, I would say. So I'm, I'm biased in both ways. I think he's a great presenter. I think it's a great topic. It's, it's in general a really great talk. So uh, take a look at that. And I did not saw that. Uh, I did saw that he posted the uh, link to the slides as well on Twitter the other day. So it's already up there. If you want to take a look, if you can't, it looks interesting. Yeah, I, I, was, 
I, Do you want to add something? Kevin? Yeah, just add a little bit that he he really highlights and and I agree with all things Jessica just said. Uh, but he also really highlights the sort of the evolution of uh, from the development perspective or from the perspective of the developer how how much interaction and how many tools you need to understand in nowadays uh, compared to ten years ago. Uh, mm -hmm. More or less, we only had like a green play button and then we were good to go right in some edits or whatever and now we need to understand this big big cncf landscape maybe or maybe not um, um so I, yeah i really want to recommend this talk as well it's uh, an amazing talk and daniel is always uh, amazing to to watch speak on a, on a scene so um so yeah uh, definitely plus one on that one awesome all right, I see that we have five more minutes left. Uh, we got one question in the chat and we have two more talks to talk about. So let's let's finish the talks and then we get to the questions. Uh, so number four, who would like to cover this one? Mm, I can briefly summarize it. So this is yeah, interesting because it touches upon the perhaps not so exciting topic of testing. And the speakers basically make the claim that testing is still treated as a pet, not as a cattle. So how can we make testing reproducible and boring? In this particular case, they suggest using BPF and a certain package called, what was that? No, in order to, can't recall the name of the product, but in order to, instead of sort of down sample and mirror a bit of production traffic, record large chunks of production traffic and, and replay it. And this was very interesting because that, problem faced by doing traffic mirroring and downsampling is particularly burdensome for smaller users that don't have that much traffic. So this was really catering to the smaller users that don't have the huge traffic volumes of large ones and thus need other tools. So I found that very nice. Thank you. Nicely summarized. And number five, the last uh, must-see talk. Yeah, that was uh, what I talked a little bit about earlier with the digital mm -hmm. twins and crossplay and Kubernetes. Um, I think I'll just uh, keep it short and uh, yeah, recommend this uh, as I already explained a little bit about it. All right. Thank you, Casper. I think we can take the slides away and then we have got a question here. Uh, I think we can, before we move to the question, we can just mention that uh, there was two days of co-located events before the main conference, and the talks for those events are already up on the YouTube channel for Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Uh, you can check the channel out in, in their app. And also the, the talks from the main conference, the ones that were linked here, they will be available within a couple of weeks. I think they said June 6th, was that correct? Yeah. I think yeah, June 6, and maybe. if you already have a KubeCon, if you were a KubeCon attendee, yeah. you can watch them now if you would like, right? Like in the yeah, in the live platform already. Uh, just a quick, quick recommendation. If you if if it's up online from the Service Mesh Con uh, introduction by Crackbox, if you want to hear karaoke and Service Mesh uh, karaoke, then <laughs> check out that one because that was really funny. <laughs> Thank you, Casper. OK, we have two more minutes. So uh, let's uh, go through this question. What's your thoughts on the SIG store? I have a feeling there's a lot of talk about supply chain and transparency, but no one talks about how to actually use the transparency logs and alerts. Question from uh, Simon. Does anyone have a good answer to that one? I think this is. I mean, if you relate that to, for example, vulnerability scanning, you have all of these tools that can produce a lot of detailed information, but you still have to make up your own mind. What kind of policies and how should you really deal with these things? So I guess that's the same thing for all supply chain related security. You get a tool that will show you a lot of what's happening, but it cannot recommend you the right policies. OK, thank you. Does anyone have anything else to add on that topic? I did not go here to my week. <laughs> All right. But then I think we're done for today. And I would like to thank everyone that attended. Uh, of course, both uh, listeners and the panelists. Thank you very much for... Uh, let's see if we got one more question, maybe. Mm -hmm. What's your top takeaway from KubeCon that is not a product or technology? That's an interesting question. 
That's a good one. Uh, I, I really think community uh, is uh, a, a really important thing here. Um, just start contributing. It's not that hard. Contrib contributions can be everything. This is a contribution to the CNCF as well. Mm -hmm. So just get started contributing um, in whatever way you find uh, natural for whatever place you are in. It should be just get started. I think that's my main point. Yeah, I think Thank I can you. add to that that yeah. uh, like it, it's it, there's so much contributions that are not tech. So there's documentation, there's management, there's cat herding. It's like all these things that are not actually writing the code that is still required to make a successful uh, project. And if you are interested more in that, you can check out Silas Morgan's talk around uh, something documentation for a project. And uh, it was really great because it really covered like all the things uh, uh, that you can do when it comes to documentation. And then I think that's Lancaster and um, oh, I forgot the name of the other person. They did a talk about like, so you're a contributor. Uh, what does that really mean? Or like you're a, it was a content manager. What does that really mean? Uh, and and that was like all about things that the project needs. And they had like for different stages, uh, different things the project need to, to take it to the next step. And there are so many things that need to happen. Uh, so get involved, be part. And it's very including and very welcoming. And I would say that if you want to be a part, it, you will be received warmly. Yeah, thank you. All right, that wraps it up for today. Uh, take care, everyone. And yeah, we'll see you next time, I guess. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, Bye. Bye.